Welcome to the Great Man Within podcast. Every episode is designed to help you discover and live the great man within you. I'm about to make some assumptions about you and your content consumption habits. And as I read off these assumptions one by one, I'd like for you to get really present to what feelings and emotions come up, whether they're feelings of resistance or feelings of resonance or any emotion or feeling in between, just get present as I read off these assumptions to you. Let's begin. You're spending too much time consuming content. You're not retaining enough of the content that you're consuming. You're not seeking enough diversity in the sources of the content that you're consuming. You're not creating enough with the content that you're consuming. Now, what came up for you as I made those assumptions about your content consumption habits? Whether it was resistance, whether it was resonance, or you felt some truth that came through, hang on to those feelings. Because today you're going to be exploring five crucial questions that you should be asking yourself on a regular basis around the content that you're consuming. Why you're consuming it, how you're consuming, what sources that you're consuming from. And the reason why this is so important, fellas, is because we are living in an era of information obesity. If we consumed food the way that we consume our information, we'd be a world of thousand pounders. As as I get a chance to sit atop a community, multiple communities of men, I see men just greedily gobbling up information indiscriminately over and over again. Why? Because we're hungry for info. There's a payoff. It feels intellectually satisfying. And information has never been more abundant or better produced than it is today. You know, Eric Schmidt, the former chairman and CEO of Google, five years ago, I believe, said something profound. And this this kind of blew my mind. He said, we are creating more content every two days than we did from the dawn of humanity till the year 2003. Can you start to really get a sense of how incredible that statistic is? More content and info every two hours is being produced than the dawn of humanity to 2003. And that statistic is five years old. We are probably creating more content and info in a few hours than we did from the dawn of humanity to 2003. And that info is being gobbled up by us. Now that is a problem because we know guys that the number one enemy to living a powerful and intentional life is drift. And most of us are drifting when it comes to our information consumption habits. The way that we break free from drift, and I write about this in my book, Design Your Future, you create an awakening moment. You wake up from that drift. You disrupt those patterns and habits of whatever that is that you're drifting in. And today we're going to be disrupting with these five questions, your information consumption habits. And then the third and final stage is you get to design new empowered habits with intentionality around how, in this case, you consume your content. So before I equip you with those five questions, which have changed my life and allowed me to be much more intentional and precise, I want to just give you some of the context for the ways in which we consume content, right? Because there's a lot, there's a broad swath of content that's out there. So when I talk about content, I'm talking about the books you're reading, the audio books you're listening to, the podcasts that you're listening to, the TED Talks you're watching, all forms of media, and there's so many different forms. Here are just a few. Think about how you consume news. Maybe it's television, maybe it's articles, maybe there's a daily digest of emails that you get, maybe there's breaking news, there's news apps, you know, that are notifying you all throughout the day. Maybe there's social media, TikTok, Facebook, Instagram, YouTube. Anything that you're consuming on YouTube is a form of media and content consumption. Television, movies, music, right? These are all forms of information that you're consuming. Even guided meditations is some form of information consumption or content consumption. Now, I'm not saying that this is bad. What I'm saying is if we're indiscriminately, if you're indiscriminately consuming content, that's a problem. That's drifting. 
So let's just quickly ask five questions that can help you to reverse course or course correct is probably a better way of saying it so that you can be more intentional. Question number one, how much time per week do you spend consuming content? Do you have any clue how much time per week that you spend consuming content? And if you go through all of those categories that I just mentioned, and there are probably a few more that I left out, you're probably going to be appalled by how much time you sit gorging at the buffet of information. One of the big wake-up calls for me years ago was just even tracking how much time I spent on my cell phone, right? Because when I'm on my cell phone, most times I'm a consumer of information versus a creator. And I remember back in 2016, 2017, when I downloaded my first time tracker, I was shocked to find out I spent four and a half hours a day, four and a half hours a day on my phone. And that didn't even count the television that I was watching, the books I was reading, right? And when I started to stack that up, if you look at the end of one week of time, just on my phone alone, 30 hours, 30 hours of time just on my phone alone. And when I started to make some better, more thoughtful ways that I engaged with my phone, I was able to reduce that in half. And when you take out two hours a day and can repurpose that to creation, to intentionality, to exercise, to relationships, your life changes, fellas. I used to tell the story on stage, when I made that shift of four and a half hours a day down to two hours per day, in my first 90 days, I had 180 extra hours of free time. I wrote my first book, Design Your Future. Think about that. That was a life-changing experience that allowed me to basically blow open a whole new side of my business that book led to keynote speeches and coaching opportunities led to hundreds of thousands of dollars of business revenue all because I got more thoughtful around the time with which and how I was consuming info so do an exercise track for one week how much time you are spending consuming content chances are you'll be appalled question number two am I procrastinating we can rationalize that I'm getting smarter and I'm doing research and you know, I'm, I'm building up my intellectual capacity or I'm preparing for something. Chances are on some level, you're procrastinating because consuming content can feel like a payoff, can feel like you're doing work, that you're educating yourself and you're getting smarter and chances are you are. And at the same time, there's probably some form of procrastination that's keeping you on the sideline because it's easier it's safer to consume than it is to create, than it is to do something new, than it is to fumble around. Ask yourself the question, am I procrastinating with this continued content consumption? Question number three is perhaps one of the most important questions you could ask yourself of all. What is my retention strategy for the content that I'm consuming? I am amazed, gentlemen, when I see people who are consuming ungodly amount of hours of podcasts, reading dozens of books a year, when I ask them the question, what's the key insight or what's the lesson you've learned? Or what do you remember from that episode or from that book? How few people can remember anything or, or more than just a superficial explanation of what they listened to or what they learned. And for me, that's mind blowing because it's like, why are you doing this? Why are you spending hundreds of hours or thousands of hours a year consuming content and info with very little to show for it? Now, listen, if your strategy for consuming information is to help you relax, maybe it's for joy, maybe it's for play, then great. As long as you know that, that's great. But I'm talking about a lot of guys who are listening to personal development podcasts or reading personal development books that they can't remember much or anything of what they've learned What's the point? You know, Spotify at the end of the year tells you how many hours that you've spent listening to someone's podcast. And I remember last year, I had a bunch of people come to me and be like, hey, Dominic, I listened to 300 hours of your podcast last year. I'm simultaneously humbled. And I'm also kind of like, is that the best use of your time, guys? <laughs> like, could you be using some of that time to create something in your life instead? You know, I'm going to be okay over here. If you don't listen, if you listen to 150 hours and spend the other 150 hours of your time doing something with your life, I'm actually more happy than you just sitting here and gobbling up everything that I'm putting out. I don't want you to listen to every single episode. You know, the, the, yes, it's humbling. 
the same time, I feel like maybe there's more you can be doing with that time. But I digress. We're here in this question to talk about what are you doing to retain the information? One of the strategies that changed my life came from an author named Timothy Sanders. We'd hired him a few years ago, a few years ago, it's like six years ago now when I was still at Prudential. I wrote about him in my book on purpose leadership. And he's written a book called, I think, Love is the Killer App. And it's kind of like a how to win friends and influence people for the modern era, right? And one of the things that he said was, you know, he loves reading books, but this problem of the info coming in, you know, and then leaving just weeks later was a problem for him. And he said, you know, his strategy of just underlining the key passages in the book that he was reading was not effective because when he went back to that book to try and find the passages, it became cumbersome to flip through all the pages in the book. He needed a better way. And this one hack that he used that he taught me radically increased the amount of information that I was able to recall unconsciously. And it was, he would sit with a notebook and as he underlined key insights, key passages or passages that he disagreed with, he would write it down in that book with the page number associated with it. And I implemented this strategy five or six years ago. Now this took this takes extra time, guys. Like as I'm reading the book, I actually have to read it, write it slower. I'm transferring that insight to a piece of paper. But as I do that, it actually anchors in that knowledge at a deeper level. That process alone is worth its weight in gold because I can recall passages, quotes, insights where people are like, dude, how do you remember all this stuff? It's not just that I have a, a good memory. It's, it's, it's not that I have a great memory. It's that I actually use a mechanism that helps me to anchor in that knowledge at a deeper level. This second benefit though, has changed my life radically. The fact that when I go back weeks or months or even years later to that book, I now have five pages, 10 pages, 20 pages of the juiciest bits, tidbits of knowledge and wisdom and information. I can quickly access that. That's the stuff guys that has helped me to create keynote speeches, corporate workshops, books, podcasts that have generated millions of dollars of revenue over the course of these last five or six years. And it's directly associated with that information that I have taken that little extra time to bring down into my conscious awareness and then to create a system that I can recall it much more quickly later. If you don't have a retention strategy then you're wasting or under clubbing your time. Question number four, do all the authors of this content look just like me? Do all of the authors of the content that I'm consuming look just like me? Another way of asking that is, is the content that I'm consuming reinforcing and narrowing my worldview or is it expanding my worldview? Now, I've told this story a number of times on this podcast, but if you're a new listener, even if you're an older listener, if you heard the story, this is going to be helpful for you. Six or seven years ago, I did the exercise of looking at the books that I'd read over the course of that year. 20 books that I'd read that year were written by, 19 of the 20 books I'd read that year were written by straight white men. Didn't make me a bad person. It just called into question, am I actually consuming information from diverse enough resources to expand my worldview, to expose myself to different perspectives, to challenge the way that I looked and saw the world because I'm swimming in my own little bubble, how to, how stepping outside of that. And over these last six or seven years, I've made a conscious effort to consume information from people who don't look like me, people who are of different ages, different genders, different gender identities, different racial identities, different religious identities, come from different socioeconomic backgrounds, who have opposing political views to me, who have similar political views to me. I've become a better man. It's challenged my values, my worldviews. In some cases, strengthened my values. Help me to get more precise because when you are reading someone or listening to someone who is not like you, it can call into question some of these areas where maybe you're a little bit flimsy in your stance to get either deeper and more thoughtful about that particular stance or to actually see a new way of being and to be more open. So I would offer up to you, do an inventory of the podcast you're listening to, the TV shows that you're watching, 
the books that you're reading. Do these authors look and sound just like you? Or are you consuming from a diverse buffet of different cuisines? Question number five, are my social media feeds consciously curated? Are my social media feeds consciously curated? Chances are the answer is absolutely not for most people. You know, we've been on social media platforms for a decade now, maybe even longer. You know, when you're talking about Facebook and obviously some of the newer platforms like Instagram and TikTok, and then, you know, Twitter has been around for a while as well. LinkedIn, of course. And all it takes is a nanosecond to connect with someone, but then you've granted them years or even a lifetime of access to your mental and emotional space. And every single day when you check these social media feeds, you're being fire hosed by these hundreds or thousands of people that you follow with what's going on in their lives. And it may be triggering to you. It may actually not be generative to you. It could be actually a net negative in your life when you're playing that comparison game, when you're playing that triggering game. I love social media. I believe it's a force for great if you learn how to play the game correctly. I am very conscious with who I choose to follow and I apply the Marie Kondo, life-changing magic of tidying up philosophy to all of my social platforms, which means does this person spark joy? Does this person spark perspective? Does this person spark creativity? When you ask those kinds of questions, very few people meet that criteria. And so it's an opportunity to do a spring cleaning, you know, like I'm, I'm tipping up now at about 700 people on Instagram that I follow, which is far less than the thousands of people that a lot of others follow. But I know that I'm approaching a place where I need to go back in. I desire to go back in and recalibrate who I'm following to get it down to a few hundred people that when they end up in my feed, I know I'm going to get something that expands my perspective, that challenges my worldview, that gives me a gateway and a portal to joy, to love, to creativity. But when I find that getting out of balance, then all of a sudden when I scroll through the feeds and I get these bullshit updates or things that, yeah, maybe like I, I care about this person, but when they post, it's, it's just kind of some mundane trivialities that I don't need to see every single day, then I'm drifting. You know, I'm allowing, I'm granting that access to my sacred mental and emotional and spiritual space. No mas. So ask yourself the question, are my social media feeds consciously curated? All right. I'm going to ask one more bonus question for you before I recap the five questions you want to ask yourself on a regular basis around the information you're consuming. Here's the bonus question. If I were to repurpose just one hour of time per week that I spent consuming information and use that one hour to create something, what would I create and how might my life change? If I were to repurpose just one hour of content consumption per week and instead used it to create something, what would I create and how might my life change? over the course of time. Now, remember when you start to quantify how much time you consume, uh, how much time you're consuming content per week, you may find it's 20, 30, 50 hours. All I'm asking is a measly one hour of your time where instead of sitting at the buffet of information and gobbling it up, you are actually creating something, writing a poem, recording your own podcast that you never have, you have to start a podcast, but pretend that you've got one. Just pick up your phone and speak about something you care about for 20 minutes. See how that goes. Writing a blog that you'd never have to publish, but just get in the habit of creating something. Draft an outline to a book. Pull out your video, pull out the, the video um, app on your phone and record something like you were going to put up a five minute YouTube video. Start to flex the muscle of creating something. That's the new frontier of learning. You could only learn so much gobbling up information, consuming information. The next level of learning and stepping into your power, especially as your great man, is creating. It's really, really a beautiful process to go through when you think you know something, but then have to teach it. And you'll find that there's gaps in your wisdom and your understanding that you think you know, but when it's time to articulate that to someone else, you find that there's all these blind spots. I found that all the time when I sat down to write my two books, right? I thought I had this like perfect outline in my mind. It was clear as day. And then when I started to write it, 
There were all these gaps in understanding, but learning how to fill in those blanks and fill in those gaps and how to articulate something that moves someone, inspires someone, helps them to feel what I'm feeling on the inside. That's the next level of learning. It's a beautiful thing, fellas, but that only happens when you create the space for it. So let me recap those five questions for you that you can be asking yourself regularly about your content creation, content consumption habits. Number one, how much time per week do I spend consuming content? Number two, am I procrastinating? Number three, what's my retention strategy for the content that I'm consuming? Number four, do all the authors that I'm consuming this content from look like me? Said differently, is the content just reinforcing my narrow worldview or narrowing my worldview or is it expanding my worldview? Question number five, are my social media feeds consciously curated or have I drifted? And the bonus question, if I were to repurpose just one hour of content consumption per week and turn it into creation, what would I create and how might my life change over the course of time doing so?